here. And today we're looking at a, a story that you may, even if you're familiar with the Bible, you might uh, not know because it's sandwiched in between David being anointed king and then next week uh, David and Goliath, which is probably the most famous Old Testament Bible story that there is. And so this might be one that you've missed as you've read through it. There's a story of a man, his wife, and his mother-in-law went on a safari to Africa. You're probably thinking this can't end well, right? But um, they hired a guide, and they set out into the jungle. And one morning, uh, the married couple woke up to find that the mother was missing. And so after a lengthy search, they, they found the woman finally in the jungle in a clearing. And in the clearing, she was face to face with a huge, roaring, ferocious lion. And so the wife said, honey, what? What are we going to do? And the husband said, nothing. Just stay very still. We're not going to do a thing. That lion got himself into this mess, and he's going to get himself out of this mess. <laughs> you know, we're all going to have, I figured half of y'all would like it and half of y'all would be offended, and that's about right. So anyway, 830 is about the same way. But, we're, you know, we're all going to have problems in life. Many times we're not going to know what exactly to do about the problem. We get ourselves in, into a mess. We can't find our way out. Today we're going to be looking at a passage that, that shows us uh, what we can do and who we can go to when we might come across a problem in our life that we're not sure how to handle. 1 Samuel 16, starting in verse 14, says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. And one of the young men answered, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul, entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Heavenly Father, as we look into this passage today, come across uh, uh, one that maybe we're not too familiar with. This passage, Lord, that you've given us that shows Saul's problem, a deep personal issue that he had. But we might have our own problems in our own lives. And let us see here in this passage what Saul did, what David did, what you did in his life, that enabled him to find some change, enabled him to find some relief even. That even through our own problems, Lord, you can bless us, and you can point our eyes toward you. So, Father, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life that we sang about today, his, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And that whoever places their faith in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for that promise that you give us today, Lord. And we pray that each and every one of us today receive something from your word or help us throughout our day, throughout our weeks, throughout our months. Lord, we love you. I pray that my words reflect your heart today, that you fill me with your spirit. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I, I want to show you uh, that in order to deal with maybe any deep problem, any deep personal issue you have, it's helpful to have at least three parties that are willing to address your problems. At least three parties that are willing to address your problem. Number one, friends are often willing to address 
your problems. I'm not talking about acquaintances. I'm not talking about people you know. I'm talking about true friends. True friends are often willing to address those problems that you have in your life that you may not be able to see. Verse 14 says that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. It's a kind of a, a quizzical verse when you look at it. When the spirit of the Lord left Saul, it says that a harmful demonic spirit replaced him. Now Samuel's theology of God as he's writing 1 Samuel was such that he, he couldn't imagine anything happening outside of God's doing or God's control. So he, he phrases it in such a way where it says it's from the Lord. Now, so he attributes to God sending the spirit. And God certainly allowed this spirit to come into Saul's life. But we know that God is not the creator or author of evil. And what we now know about what is called demonic possession or influence is that usually what happens is the person has invited those influences into their own lives. We know later that Saul would turn to witchcraft uh, to help him with problems in his life. So I believe Saul had opened his life up to this influence. And it's worth noting that palm readers and Ouija boards and dabbling the, in the occult and these type of activities are on ramps to demonic influence in a person's life. Many people ask, well, can Christian be possessed by Satan or something like that? And, and let me say this, just to give you some comfort. The Holy Spirit is in your life. Satan cannot take dominion. The Holy Spirit's in your life. Satan cannot take dominion. Now, he can, he can bother you and he can, and he can try to influence around you, but he can't reside in you. And since the Holy Spirit left Saul, it seems to me that Saul was no longer following God. Now, Christians in the church age, we believe that once you're sealed with the Spirit, you have the Spirit. But in the Old Testament time, the spirit wasn't that way. It wasn't ubiquitous. It didn't, it didn't fall on every believer. It fell on certain people that God was using, and God was using Saul, and it left him. So the fact that the spirit left Saul and was replaced by an evil one leads me to believe that Saul no longer was trusting God. So this void was taken up by another type of spirit, and the spirit was wrecking his life. And as is often the case... Saul's friends, his servants, his acquaintances even, realized it before he did. Look at verse 15. Saul's servants said to him, now listen, <laughs> a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Verse 16, let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. This is kind of like a harp. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. Now, it's no secret that music has and is a great tool to calm people, to change their mood. Think about a fussy baby, sometimes just singing a nursery rhyme. That's why they exist. A nursery song can put a, a baby at ease. Um, if you're stressed out, listening to worship music helps. Calming music can help you. We have all kind of apps now that can do that, and we have... We have uh, streaming music that we can do that. We can put earphones in our ears. We can do all these things to, to allow our mind to be, to be calmed with music. But think about Saul's time. There weren't phone, phones with uh, streaming music. There weren't even radios. There weren't even record players, right? In order to hear music, you had to hear it live. So unless you had a traveling minstrel walking around with you playing all the time, or unless you were a king, or unless you could play something, uh, you just, you couldn't play it. And so many times music, you would hear music at a festival or maybe in the center of town or something like this or maybe someone in the house. But somebody had to be playing it. You couldn't just listen to something. That's a, a new, obviously, as we know, a new invention. So we're blessed to have that. So the king's servants came up with this idea, well, let's just get someone here who can play something soothing whenever Saul needs to hear something soothing because the last thing a servant wants is a king who has absolute power, who is unpredictable in his mood. Amen. I once had a boss like that. <laughs> Worked at a golf course in high school in some college, and one of the associate uh, pros there told me, he said, now listen, this, this man is going to be, it's my first ever job, and he said, this, this, he'll be the best boss you ever have. That's what they told me. And really, I think he probably was. You know, I had different bosses throughout the years, and he probably was pretty good, 
but he was unpredictable. That was his kind of fatal flaw. Like, and, and, and these, I'm going to give you two examples of what happened, and these really happened. You could take a golf cart and wreck it and put it at the bottom of the lake on the golf course, and he would kind of be like, oh, it's okay, you know, accidents happen. And we're like, what? You know? Or you could leave the, uh, the hose where we'd wash down the golf carts. We didn't have it rolled up correctly. It was like slightly off center, and he would come in the next morning and be mad about that, and he'd throw the trash can across the cart shed. So you just never knew when he would be in one of those moods. You couldn't predict it. So if he felt like it was a mood, we all just you know, left. We just went away, right? Never knew what to expect. And so Saul became dangerous because of this spirit. And the servants never knew what kind of mood he'd be in or, or when he would be, you know, uh, in his feelings, so to speak, or in this evil spirit. So they got creative. A cynic once said, don't bother telling people your troubles. Half of them don't care, and the other half figure you probably had it coming. (laughs) But, you know, thankfully in the body of Christ, that's not true, amen? We do care. Christians should care. Families should care. And even if we think you had it coming, we're still going to pray for you. (laughs) We're still going to be there for you. And even in Saul's life, he had people who, who tried to help him, and thankfully Saul listened. Do you have people in your life who will tell you, when you're off your game, so to speak. You know, my wife's always quick to nicely let me know that. Give me a little nudge. I'm always like, what are you talking about, right? Our first expression is like, what? What do you mean? And then I realize what she's talking about, right? So do you have people in your life who can kind of tell you, hey, you know, you're, you're struggling in this area. And do you realize this? Listen to them. Because if they're your true friends and they know you well, or they're your spouse or someone in your family, they probably know you better than you know yourself. And you probably know them better than they know themselves. Friends, true friends, are often willing to address your problems if they think you'll listen. Now, if they think you're not going to listen, they'll quit talking to you. But if they think you'll listen, they will address your problems. So we have issues in our life. Our friends are often willing to address those problems. we We need to thank God for those friends. Secondly, you should be willing to address your problems just don't put the pressure on the people around you you should be willing to address your problems verse 17 so Saul said to his servants provide for me a man who could play well and bring him to me and one of the young men answered behold I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing a man of valor a man of war Prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord's with him. Now, at this point, it wasn't public knowledge like like we learned last week that David had been anointed king by Samuel. He had been anointed king even though Saul was still the king. It was not public knowledge. And so the servant then described David to Saul. He said that he can play music, which is the number one job description. If you're going to be calming someone with music, you've got to be able to play music. He said he was a man of valor. This has the idea that he had many abilities. He was able to do things. He was a warrior, which was important because you're dealing with a warrior king. He had something in common with Saul. We know later on that, that David had, had killed bears and tiger and lions and things like this when he was a shepherd. It says that he spoke well. He was prudent in speech. And he had a calming presence. Doesn't that seem like somebody you like to be around? This is what David was. And so in a lot of ways, he had a lot in common with Saul. This is important because because Saul was probably at least old enough to be his uncle, if not his father. And so the servants felt like this would be a good match. Here's a young guy who has a lot of Saul's qualities, and they had no clue that God had anointed him to be the king. So we see God working things out behind the scenes, and he felt like this would be a good match. Verse 19, therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse, that's David's father, and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep, the shepherd. Now, Saul was an interesting character because even though he was troubled, he knew, he still knew he needed help. So there was still a sense of humility in knowing that he he listened to his servants and got the help he needed. Now, the servants are probably just fearful for their own lives, or maybe they did care about him. But he knew that he needed help. And so when you have a spiritual problem in your life or a personal issue, they won't truly be fixed until you realize you need to make an effort to fix it. There were a group of tourists vis- visiting a, a village, 
a, a, a historic village, a small one. And they walked by and an old man was sitting by the fence. And they were kind of making fun of this village because it was so small, even though it's historical. And, and one of the tourists asked the old man by the fence, they said, were any great men born in this village? And the old man replied, nope, only babies. <laughs> kind of weird to see a grown man being born, wouldn't it? Every person who is a born again believer starts life as a baby in Christ. That's where we start. Whether the new disciple is six, whether they're 60, that person is still a new Christian and needs to grow in the Lord. And, and part of growing in Christ is understanding that we have to have times of self-assessment, times of self-reflection. We get this in reading God's word. We get this in our prayer life because we're all on different mile markers on our spiritual path. Some of us are on exit 211, others on exit like 184, right? We're at different places on our journey. This is part of growing up. This is part of growing spiritually. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says this. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. You know, children speak like children. You know, John David, he's my two-and-a-half-year-old. He'll come up to me sometimes. He'll say, he'll say, he hungry. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yourself, right? Or say, he want this. Or sometimes he'll say me. A lot of times he'll say he. he say, he doesn't like this. Or his new thing now is if I'm disciplining, he'll say, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's not nice. And he'll point at me and he gets all upset. That's not nice. He hungry. He don't want to do that. That's what he'll say. Now, how weird would it be? If I came up to you after church and said, he hungry, me go get lunch. And then you said something to me and I said, that's not nice. What would it be, how weird would it be if I spoke and acted like a child? It would be bizarre. It would be unsettling. And you'd be like, we're never going back to the church again. What in the world? This is what he means. Children speak like children. They think like children. They reason like children, but when you become a man, you don't act like a child anymore. Now, the context of this passage is in loving one another. This is the 1 Corinthians 13. This is the love chapter you hear at weddings so often. It's loving one another. And so as you grow spiritually, you learn how to love each other. This also means knowing how your actions not only affect yourself, but affect other people. So he's saying as you're growing spiritually, you don't act like a child where you expect and demand everybody to get everything for you. My two and a half year old expects and demands me and, and our family to get everything for him. Now, the real reason is he won't go in the other room because he's scared of the dark. That's the real reason he won't go in there. But he expects me to do it, or, or, and then I won't do it. And he'll say, that's not nice, right? Now it's time for you to do it yourself. So if you don't want to help yourself with your problems for your sake, Paul's saying here, at least do it for other people's sake. Put yourself above others. That's what grown-ups do. Grown-ups do it. You need to be willing to address your own personal problems, if not for your sake, for other people's sake. Because what happens is, if you won't listen to others, if you won't take matters into your own hands, people quit coming around. People quit talking to you. But as a believer in Christ, that's not your trajectory. Your trajectory should be one of humility. One where you listen, and then you also take self-assessment. And so when you have issues you can't get around, are you listening to others? Do you have people in your life who speak that loving truth into your life? And will you ask the Lord to, to reveal your heart and pray and read your Bibles? Number three, finally, God is always willing to address your problems. Amen. And this is where the, the power is. Oftentimes our friends will let us know the issue. We can work on it, but we got to have God working as well. He's got to be working in our lives. Look at verse 20. Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a, a young goat, and he sent them by David, his son, to Saul. Now, one of the purposes of this right here was, was to show, show Saul that David was not from a family of need, that his family could provide his own sustenance, that he was not being forced to be there. Saul didn't have to go grab him from the house and bring him back, which he could have done. He was willing to serve the king. 
Now, being asked to serve the king at his demand was one of the warnings that Samuel tried to tell Israel when they demanded a king. We touched on this a little bit last week, but they wanted a king. They wanted to be like the rest of the nations. And Samuel, who was the judge of the nation, said, you don't want a king. You, you need to have the Lord God as your king. They said, we want kings. We want kings. And God finally gave them what they asked for, even though it wasn't good for them. 1 Samuel 8 talks about this. Samuel tells Israel this. He says, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war in the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day because the Lord has given you what you want. Yet they said, we still want a king. That's the thing about God. God's so gracious. Sometimes he will give us, give us what we pray for when we don't need it. And many times for us to realize, hey, I need to trust in the Lord. Sure enough, Saul needs help. So he drafts David, the son of Jesse, who has been privately anointed to be the next king. And so we see the Lord working things together by, by having the future king serve in the service of the current king. So David's getting kind of a, he'll be getting kind of a crash course in the, what not to do and what to do. If you ever had a job sometimes, you were, is it right out of college, and I had jobs at different churches and on staffs, and I learned, sometimes I learned what not to do more than I learned what to do. And we see here uh, David getting this education, so to speak. So God helps Saul with his problem, but he does so in a way that blesses David by gaining him entry into the palace and is preparing David for his future while blessing the current king, Saul. So we see God working that out. Verse 21, David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Now, David, by all accounts, was just an all-around great guy. If he was from Monk's Corner, he'd be one of these guys that, you know, he, he comes to church, he's here on Easter with a bow tie, you know, he plays football, plays sports, he's just, you know, he's just a, a good yes ma'am, yes sir, let me hold the door for you, I'll take your groceries to the car for you. He was just a great guy. Everybody loved him, everybody wanted to be around him. Saul loved him, Saul liked him, and so he, he, he gained such access to Saul that Saul said, you, you're going to carry my armor for me out to war. You're going to carry all my weapons, which was a very crucial and critical position. There would be a high level of trust. And so Saul grew to trust David tremendously. And if there's one thing that a king needs, it's someone they can trust. Saul trusted David. Now we'll see later that Saul became jealous of David. But he trusted him tremendously. Verse 22. And Saul sent to Jesse, his father, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. Now listen, Saul did not need Jesse's permission for this. But he liked David so much, he had respect for the family so much, he asked permission. Even though he didn't need it, he was the king. And of course, they allowed it. So we see Saul having an evil spirit that debilitates him. He asks for help. God gives him then the biggest blessing he could ask for, a servant he could trust. And let that be a lesson for us. If there's an area you can't figure out in your life, we should go to the Lord. But also many times when we humble ourselves and go to the Lord, sometimes the blessing he gives us is larger than anything we can imagine. And it ends up being better for us by having the problem. Saul had everything he needed, but he had an issue he had a spirit that was causing him to act horrible, horribly, and the Lord blesses him with a man he can trust, who has his back, who soothes his soul. And in the meantime, 
God blesses David by allowing him to see how a king should act, how a king should not act. Never, if you seek him to help you with your problems, many times God will bless you in ways you can't imagine. And even Saul, who had started turning from the Lord, because he was the king of Israel, the Lord was still blessing him. Verse 23. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. The harmful spirit departed from him, and all the servants were happy that the king was well. God blessed Saul with David. And even though Saul had replaced his relationship with worldly influences, replaced the relationship with God with demonic influences, God still gave him grace by sending him David, a man after God's own heart. And David became kind of an extension to Saul of God. When he saw David, he kind of saw the heart of God with him. It's amazing to have a friend who was so focused into following Jesus that being around them was almost like an extension of the Lord. God is always willing to address and help you with your problems. Your friends can talk into your life. You can talk into your life. But God needs to talk into your life. The only way you're going to get that is through Scripture. I saw a Lifeway research thing this week. I said the number one, without a doubt, attribute of young adults who stay in the church, who don't fall away from the church, the number one thing they can do, and there's a lot of them, serving, praying, things like this. The number one attribute of those who stay in the church is that they are reading the Bible. God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It discerns the intents and the thoughts. It alone can change your heart, which changes your life. And so we see that God's always willing to help us with our issues. Well, there was a 100th anniversary celebration, and it was a celebration of the the arrival of missionaries in an African country, Zaire. And it was this deep part of the Congo. And much much of the the, the tribe and the the town uh, had become Christian over the 100 years. At the end of the celebration, a very old man stood up and he said that he wanted to give a speech that he was going to be dying soon because he was old and he needed to tell a story that hadn't been told about this. And he explained that 100 years ago when those first missionaries came, the people there who weren't Christians, obviously, they didn't want the, the missionaries to be there and they didn't know if they could believe the message or not, the message of Jesus, the message of the gospel. So they came up with a plan where they slowly and secretly poisoned the missionaries and watched their families die, them and their children. Not all of them, but many of them died and buried, and they watched it happen. The missionaries never knew what was happening. They didn't know they were being poisoned. They didn't know why they were dying. But the way they handled the death, the way they handled the situation, by always praising the Lord, by, by, having, by having a hope in the future, by trusting Jesus, by the way they handle it, and by the way they preach the gospel, it convinced those tribal people that their message was true. And many turned to the gospel and to the message because they saw how these missionaries dealt with what would be the worst thing that could happen to them. You may never know the whys of the problems you have in your life. You may never know where they came from. You may never know why you have it. But you can know that you can trust Christ through them. And as you trust Christ and as people watch, they might believe in your God, in Jesus Christ, just by seeing how you handle them. Not only the Holy Spirit can help you with your reaction. And when we have a problem in our life that hits us, many times we don't know how we react until that happens. The Bible says the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. The Holy Spirit will reside in your life and give you what you need when you need it. You never know who's watching 
You never know who may be in heaven one day because they believe the message after seeing God's people react to the problems of life. Heavenly Father, as we close our time together today, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And we thank you for the grace that you give us as we even learned about Saul's life and, and David, and how you gave him grace when, when he didn't even deserve it. And, 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 you, and you made his life easier. Even though he turned from you and had a problem, you blessed him. And you prepared David along the way. Father, maybe some of us in here today at this certain moment don't have really many issues. Maybe we, things are going well for us. But we probably know someone who does. Maybe there's someone we can pray for and, and speak to and that God would, would, would allow us to, to, uh, uh, to give us an opportunity if it's his will to do so, Lord. Maybe there's someone here that have an issue that is burdening them. They don't know what to do about it. But they have friends, they have your word, they have you to go to, they'll continue to do that, Lord. That you will show them the way as you always will. Maybe there's one in here that's never placed their faith in Jesus before, never turned from their sin and, and asked forgiveness, that today they would do so, and that today they'd be saved, they'd become a Christian today. I'm a follower of Jesus, bought by the blood of Christ. They would make that decision today. Lord, we thank you for how you are always working behind the scenes in our lives. And Romans 8, 28 say that all things work together for the good of those who love them. Even when we sin, even when people sin against us, you can still work things out and you still work things out. For our good and your glory. So, Lord, as we close our time together today, we'll be thankful for how you're working in our lives and thankful for the people you put in our lives, the church family, for family family, and for you. Lord, we give this time to you today. We ask these things in Jesus' name.